Hey guys, it's DC here and welcome to The Daily Hack. For anyone who's new here, The Daily Hack is a video that I do every uh, couple of days during the week where I go over the top three news stories of the day, the Try Hack Me leaderboards, and then at the end I answer any of your questions. Today's number one news story is that Google Chrome has a new feature where if you open over a hundred tabs, it gives you a little smiley face. Today, I learned something new, um, which is that Google Chrome Mobile has an Easter egg that turns the tab count into a smiley face when you have over 100 tabs. I only realized this because the other day I was flicking through uh, all of my multiple tabs and I was like, oh my God, I have so many tabs open. I should probably you know, close some of them off because my phone is, um, I was worried basically that my phone was going to catch fire because it gets really hot every now and then. Uh, but I think that's got something to do with me dropping it. But anyway, I then Googled and I found this news article that was posted just yesterday that says, uh, now in Google Chrome, if you open up 100 tabs, it brings up a little smiley face instead of the uh, tab count button. So if you go over 100 tabs in Google Chrome Mobile, instead of that little tab that says like, you've got uh, 100 or like 90 tabs or 30 tabs or whatever it is open, once you go over 100, it has a little smiley face. It's, um, yeah, it's just a, a stupid feature, I guess, a little Easter egg from Google, but um, yeah, kind of funny nonetheless. And uh, I have now since closed most of those tabs. In other news, over to the Ryak ransomware. Yet again, we're back to Ryak. Uh, it has driven up the average ransom to 111,000 US dollars on average that they make from a ransomware attack. I say they like Ryak is a, a group of uh, you know hackers out there, but it's just a, a name of a ransomware. The article that I found reads, the first quarter of the year recorded an increase on the average amount of ransomware operators demand from their victims. Compared to the previous quarter, a 33% swell was noted, driven by the Sodinikibi and Ryak ransomware operators. Behind this are successful attacks against large enterprises that can afford to pay top dollar to get their data back. Side note, to any organizations out there that don't have off-site backups that are recorded in a father-son, grandfather, whatever it's called, situation. That's, it's pretty much the best way of protecting yourself against these sort of attacks. I know it's not ideal to restore a backup from three days ago rather than one from that exact same day, but you know, would you rather pay hundreds of thousands of dollars or you know, would you maybe prefer to just recreate that documentation or whatever it was, uh, changes in the system from before? I know that's not possible for some places, but Hey, maybe install some better uh, antivirus or uh, firewall systems to protect yourself against these sort of attacks. Also, I guess massive education for your users is pretty much the best way to protect against any sort of phishing scam that makes someone click on that call to action in the email that's going to get you uh, a virus on your system. The article continues, big money from big players. The details come from Coverware, a company that handles ransomware incidents and tracks threat actors with a high likelihood of keeping their word and decrypt files after getting their ransom. Coverware noted that in Q1, ransomware operators focused more on large enterprises, forcing payments out of them to get unlock keys for their own data. On average, the ransom payment for Q1 was 111,605 US dollars. In the same time frame last year, the average paid amount had exploded by 89% from the preceding quarter, even so it reached only $12,762 which is almost 3.5 lower than the last median. So it's um, yeah, it's pretty serious, these attacks. They're getting massive money. Uh, maybe I should get into writing malware. Who knows? Maybe it's a, it's a good business venture. Maybe it's, it's not so good. Uh, maybe I'll end up in jail. Uh, who knows? But you can make a lot of money out of ransomware is the, the bottom line of the story here. Uh, that's not an indication that you should write malware. But it is a good indication, I guess, for anyone who wants to get into malware uh, analysis and reverse engineering different malware uh, through different sandbox systems. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's an ever-growing industry. As we can see here, it's, uh, it's gone up 89%. So, worth having a look at. The last article is, Xiaomi tracks private browser and phone usage and then defends its behavior. Now, Xiaomi, for those of you who don't know, is a Chinese phone manufacturer um, I actually used one of their phones a little while ago, it was a few years ago now, 
uh, it had Ubuntu phone or mobile on it, whatever it was called, I can't remember. And that was the entire reason why I bought it because I wanted to use that and then install some Kali tools on it because this was way before the days of NetHunter, which is now a, a Kali operating system for phones. Anyway, the article reads, New research claims that China-based Xiaomi is tracking sensitive information and sending it to their servers if you use the Mi browser, which is bundled with an all Redmi and Mi phones, which is all of their more recent phones. In a report by Forbes, security research Gabby Serlig states that Xiaomi's browser app, a Mi browser app, sends your internet searches, including incognito mode sessions to Xiaomi servers in Singapore and Russia. Even more concerning is that Serlig states that the data being set up can easily be associated with a particular user, allowing the company to single out users they wish to track. Now, I just want to uh, interrupt the story here to say that this phone is mostly only bought in China. The majority of users who buy this phone are in China and they already have a lot of uh, censorship and I guess surveillance is a good way to say of their uh, internet usage in that country, uh, especially from ISPs. So this sort of revelation that uh, Forbes has sort of come up with in this report isn't a massive big deal, to be completely honest, because they hardly even sell these phones outside of China. And if you do some research about different phone systems and carriers and, and manufacturers, you probably wouldn't want to go and buy this phone or especially use the Mi browser anyway. Uh, you'd probably install something like the Chrome browser or Firefox browser or maybe even Brave. Who knows? It doesn't really matter and the point is that no one's really using this browser anyway. So the article reads on, my main concern for privacy is that the data sent to their servers can be very easily correlated with a specific user, uh, Serlik told Forbes. While all of this data is uploaded to remote servers in Singapore and Russia, the domains themselves are registered to an organization in Beijing. That's the company called Xiaomi. They own this device, right? Additionally, the researcher noticed that Xiaomi phones record the folders a user opens, the screens a user views, and configured settings. I can't reiterate enough about uh, do some research on the manufacturer that you're buying devices from. It's, um, if you want to buy a Chinese phone, that's fine. If you want to buy a Russian phone, that's all good. Do Russians even sell phones? I'm not sure. If you want to buy a phone from South Korea, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't, you'll never confirm security on your device, right? So just maybe have a look at Mi Browser before. It's the same with that other Chinese browser. I can't remember what it's called. It's like XC Browser or CX Browser, something like that. That also does the exact same thing. It's for the uh, different surveillance that they use in that country and it's just part of the game really of that particular government. That's not saying that your own government isn't tracking what you're doing anyway on your phone. So, you know, I guess the difference is that one, com one, different, one country tells you that they're doing it, the other one doesn't and then pleads that they're, they're not doing it. So Xiaomi is basically saying that we're not really sorry for what we're doing. Uh, in this article it reads on to say that Xiaomi is defending themselves against these claims saying that they tell users that they're doing it in their terms and conditions anyway, so they're not really doing anything wrong. And that, like I said before, that most of these devices are only actually sold inside China. The only ones that are sold outside of China are ones that have been uh, resold by different companies that they haven't authorized to do anyway. So, I don't know, it's, it seems like much of a muchness, but I thought it was an interesting story to bring in here anyway about uh, devices and different manufacturers. Alrighty, over to the TriHackMe leaderboards. Uh, it's a new day, it's a new month. Happy May, everyone. Welcome to the new month. Let's have a look who's in first place. We have Gold Wave with 1,360 points. Congratulations, uh, Gold Wave. Second place, Polo Mints. Third place, TM. Fourth place, GBL2K. And fifth place, Nobody002 from Vietnam. That's awesome. It looks like none of the big players have come in here yet to compete and uh, haven't had a go yet, but um, I'm sure things will change very quickly. It's only the third day of the month. Well, it is here in Australia anyway. Uh, for you guys, it's uh, it's probably going to be the third coming up when this video comes out. So yeah, it's, uh, it's open for anyone to sort of get into that top 50 leaderboard of the month. 
Remember that there are prizes for people who come first at the end of the month from TryHackMe. Sometimes they give out tokens for CompTIA certifications. Sometimes they give you an extension on your subscription or an ex a subscription itself if you don't already have one to TryHackMe.com. So yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. All right, and over to the comments of the last Daily Hack video. We have a few comments in here. Henry Case says, CompTIA is offering remote testing right now. Yeah, they have been um, since pretty much the start of this year. They moved all of their uh, examinations to uh, do online as well. You can do the full course and the cert online, which is awesome. I, um, I actually made a video about it a little while back, but yeah. We also have a comment here from uh, Rockhaya4. He says, hey man, I tried listening to this on Spotify, but there is only one, the first episode available. Do you plan on putting out the other ones too? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Um, I tried to do a subscription service and it was basically just way too expensive. It ended up being like $70 a month for me to uh, host a podcast on Spotify. So uh, I just canned that idea and I'll, I'll just be doing these on YouTube from now on. But yeah, it's uh, it's easily accessible on YouTube. It's easy to find um, and it's, it's more centralized that way. There's just one place to find my videos and my content. So yeah, this is, YouTube is the place to find me, basically. Anyway, that's it uh, for today's video. If you did enjoy this video, please do give me a thumbs up. Subscribe if you're new here. Drop a comment down below if you have any questions about any of the articles or questions about cybersecurity in general that you would like for me to answer on the next Daily Hack, which comes out in two or three days' time. And uh, yeah, I'll see you then. Catch you later, guys.